Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ronan Chris Murphy. Hello, taxi friends. This is Ronan, and I'm so bummed that I'm not getting to hang out with you in person this year. The Taxi Road Rally is such a special part of my year. It's such a great time. I work all over the world, but uh, I will not book international travel if it conflicts with the road rally. So very disappointed that we are not all together in person, but I'm very happy uh, that Michael has invited me to share a little bit of stuff with you again this year. So the bummer of the road rally is that we are not all together. I have such a great time being with all of you, meeting new folks. The one upside with this, though, is when I was talking about uh, things to do with Michael, he wanted me to share some information about mastering, and uh, which I'm very happy to do. But you know that old saying, uh, talking about mastering is like swimming about architecture? Maybe you haven't. But anyway, it's really tough to talk about mastering. We can talk about concepts and things like that. Um, and when we do workshops at the Road Rally, we don't really have full studios and... Uh, really excellent ways to demonstrate things all the time. So in this situation where I'm getting to pre-record something for you that Michael's going to share here, I'm actually going to be able to show you some of these techniques that you can use on your own in a very kind of practical, hands-on sort of way. So that is the one little upside of this being virtual instead of all of us being together. So let's dive into some DIY mastering. But before we do, we need to address the elephant in the room, and that is... Mastering is a really specialized skill. Mastering is kind of the Jedi arts of the audio world. And it really is much more about the judgment or the, of the man or the woman at the controls rather than it is a piece of software, a piece of hardware, or a specific technique. It is about judgment. Myself, personally, I was a professional audio engineer for about 20 years before I felt I had the kind of knowledge, the judgment, the skill set to do mastering for other people. Uh, also, you know, it took me a while to get solid gear to do mastering uh, as well. So it is something very specialized. And also the reality too is, you know, in terms of just the gear, um, you know, when you book a mastering engineer, you know, I've personally, I have literally tens of thousands of dollars of outboard equipment for mastering. My mastering speakers are $30,000 custom built speakers. I have custom analog to digital converters and the room I'm in, I bought this room because uh, I, I bought this whole building because the room is good for mastering. But the reality is there are times where using an outside mastering engineer doesn't make sense. One obviously is you're kind of broke. Two is you're on deadlines. You know, there's a cool taxi listing for a submission and it's due the next morning and you're up at midnight kind of tweaking your mix or writing new parts. And there's no way you're going to be able to work with an outside mastering engineer in that situation. And also you just may want to control the process all the way through, which is totally valid. Even though one of the benefits often of a mastering engineer outside of yourself is that you get to have an outside perspective on it. You get Somebody listening to your stuff on another, another set of speakers, another set of room, uh, another different room, et cetera. But uh, all that said, again, there are valid reasons why it's not possible or even desirable to use an outside mastering engineer like myself. So what I'm going to try and do is demystify the process a little bit for you, uh, simplify the process for you, and kind of show you some kind of techniques that you can use in your own work that are simple and inexpensive and things like that. So you should be able to get some really good work done regardless of where you are in terms of your skill set. And I hope I can share that with you. One thing I'm also trying to do here is if you are going to master, I really want you to master. I I want you to be making those judgment calls. So I'm trying to discourage you from, you know, sending things off to some online robot for mastering, or even if you have different plugin suites of using their presets, there's not really any reason to do that. And in fact, I find those to be often problematic. Um, that's nothing against, you know, the software that might do that, but I would encourage you to avoid presets. So you've got more control of the, over the process. You can make better decisions 
about what you're doing. And also some of those presets and things can actually create problems when they're trying to solve them. So just hang with me for a little bit. I'm going to walk you through what we can do, how you can do this on your own. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you a process and I'm just going to use free software that came with the DAW. And as I said, I've got tens of thousands of dollars of outboard. I've got tons and tons of plugins from high end companies and things like that. Uh, but I want to show you how much you can accomplish just with these basic tools. And, and then once you kind of get your feet wet a little bit, you can expand and see what kind of additional tool sets might work for you. You know, you may want to use hardware at some point. Uh, you may want to expand it. And if you've done this a little bit, you'll sort of get to know what tools you're missing or what kind of characteristic things you would like. But, um, but if you're going to expand, there are a lot of cool uh, companies. There's like uh, Isotope. They make a product called Ozone, which is this big bundle of um, everything you would need to do some decent mastering and more. Um, you know, there's a company called Plugin Alliance that makes a bunch of the uh, things that I use. Fab Filter is another company uh, that has most of the tools you would ever need to do good mastering work. And then anything beyond what you could get for those, uh, you know, you're looking at specialized things and you'll know more about that once you spend a little bit of time doing some mastering yourself. So let's dig into it. So first thing I need to tell you is you cannot master while you mix. It is impossible to master while you mix. You can mix with aggressive processing on the master bus, but that's just aggressive processing on the master bus. When you're mixing, I want you to take off your mixer hat and put on your mastering engineer hat. Export your file from your mixing session without any kind of limiters or anything on it. Export that, create a new session in your DAW, and then bring that uh, mix you've done in there. Uh, one, it's going to give you better perspective, but it's also going to make it a lot easier to show you some of the techniques that we're going to be looking at. And what we want to do now, especially while you're still developing your skill set, is to look at mastering based on target references. So mastering based on target references. It's just kind of a fancy way to say, we're going to listen to some stuff we think sounds good. We're going to see if we can get our stuff to sound good like that. Um, but there is more to it. And there's a few things you should know and be careful of. Um, so pick out something you like. If you're mastering something, if you've done a trailer piece, you know, find a way to download a, you know, great master of trailer music. If you've done a contemporary country track, you know, download into your DAW a great contemporary country thing. And make sure that when you pick those references that they do really represent the whole breadth of what you want to do in terms of Sonic. Because as much as you might love a record that was released in 1974 uh, and you are trying to do something that's more 2020, um, they're going to sound very different. So pick up, pick that reference from 1974 uh, if you want your stuff to sound like that kind of music from 1974. But make sure that you really get something that makes sense in terms of brightness or that low end or loudness or dynamics or any of these kinds of things. Uh, and then use that as a reference. So let's get into it and do a little bit of listening. I'm actually going to do something I don't do very often, and that is work on headphones. And the reason I'm doing this is because making the video sound coming out of speakers ends up getting in the way of uh, messes up the audio for what you guys are going to hear. All right, so let's dig into it. But I want to show you something first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play you two examples of great sounding records. Um, they are, they came out around the same time. They are both American rock artists um, that um, released on a major label uh, with male singers that sold more than a million records. So let's listen to A. And B. All right. We're going to listen again, but what I want you to focus on this time is listen how bright each one is. How much energy or excitement or edge is there up on the top of this? Here, 
plan B. <laughs> kind of different, huh? I hope you heard that. One more time. A. B. Yeah, very, very different. So what we're going to focus on now is listen to the vocal. Listen how present the vocal is on one compared to the other. Is one Does one sort of feel kind of in your face and one maybe feel a little tucked back in? Maybe one feels inside the guitars, one feels on top of the guitars. So A. And B. So now you've got this dilemma. You're you're mixing a track that you want to sound like an American rock band that will sell be on a major label and sell more than a million copies. How bright do you make <laughs> uh, the master? Or how warm or dark sounding do you want to make the master? Uh, do you kind of tweak it so the vocals pop out or do you let the vocals kind of tuck in? And there's not a right answer because both of these are fabulous sounding records, both extremely successful. One is Incubus, one is Daughtry. Uh, and they were done by like some of the top folks in the world. So it can get a little bit tricky. So make sure that when you're picking out references that you kind of know, hey, this is sort of the sound I'm going for. And you can start making some good decisions about that. You know, I personally, uh, I like the sound of that Incubus one a little bit better, but I also love the sound of the second one just for different reasons. This is also one of the reasons, again, a robot online can't really help you make that choice. And if you pull up a, you know, American rock preset or something like that, or hard rock preset from uh, some piece of software, it's not going to know what your mix is and how to tweak it. In that way. So I'm trying to give you guys command uh, and control over the creative work you do. But this whole business of listening to other things is going to be super, super powerful for us. So what you want to do is pull your mix into your DAW and, and then pull in a reference. So what we're going to use for a mix is something some of you have heard before. Uh, there's an artist, Dave Nakmanoff. Well, I actually met at a Taxi Road Rally and produced a wonderful album for. And uh, I love this song, get to listen to it all the time. And Dave has been kind enough to let me use it for demonstrations. So it's a song called uh, Fragile Thing uh, from his album Step Up. So here it is, just the raw mix without any kind of mastering on it. A candle in China, a walking on eggshells most of the time. A candle in China. And obviously a tune like this, which is acoustic, more kind of like the Eagles than it is, you know, Incubus, um, going and picking a hard rock or a heavy metal master may not make a lot of sense. So I picked another, another record that I love by this Canadian band called The Tragically Hip and uh, a song called Ahead by a Century. And again, it's similar tempo. It's a record I love the sound of. Um, and also, again, acoustic guitar driven. So it's a pretty good reference to check out. This is a All right. When we compare the two, obviously, you know, our target reference is Tragically Hip Record sounds a lot more exciting or sounds sort of dull, but we're going to we're going to be able to address that. But that just reminded me something of something I really, really wanted to tell you. Um, let's go back to our reference mixes again that we listened to a little bit earlier, the Incubus and that Daughtry. So. Does one of those sound louder to you? Uh, you know, when I when I hear it, that Daughtry one sounds, it jumps out of the speakers more. So it sounds like a louder, you know, more aggressive record, at least to me. But as I go back and forth, let me direct you over here. Check out the meters between these two. You notice there's not really a big difference. So when we look at the meters, 
they're about the same loudness, but one of them feels louder. Uh, and that's really important to keep in mind because it, the meters can only tell you how much energy there is overall or in certain frequencies. They can't tell you the way things feel. And where things can sometimes get problematic if you have a robot doing your mastering versus a human is there are certain situations where one frequency on a certain singer will be very pleasing and not pleasing on another. A lot of times with like female rock singers around 2.5K can kind of be an unpleasant and piercing, whereas a, a darker male vocal pushing up that same range can help bring some clarity and detail. Same thing like a uh, a guitar, like a, a single cool pickup guitar. There's certain ranges that can be kind of edgy and unpleasant uh, so you might in mastering, you may want to pull those down. Whereas if it's like a fat, less Paul sound, you actually might want to increase those same frequencies to bring clarity. So we don't need robots because you guys are going to be masters with all this stuff. All right. So let's go back here. Thing, a okay. So obviously those are very, very different. Um, one thing is the target reference is a lot, lot louder. So what we're going to do is not try and make ours super loud yet. We're going to try and just lower our target a little bit so we can do some better comparisons. So uh, I'm using Pro Tools. So I, I can use a feature they call Clip Gain. You can just visually get those to look kind of similar. Good. That makes a lot more sense. Now we can actually start evaluating between the two. The way we humans are naturally wired is when we compare those. My, my guess is that when I listened to one versus the other, you probably heard that our commercial release has more of stuff, you know, brighter, for instance, listen to that. See if you hear that. And to be fair, it does. But what I want to encourage you to do is learn to think subtractively first. And uh, this takes a lot of effort and a lot of practice. It's natural for me now. But when you're comparing to these other references, try and see what, um, what yours has too much of rather than not enough of. Do you notice how ours kind of has this whoa, 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 kind of low honkiness, uh, kind of fat, a little bit tubbiness in there? So rather than going and trying to brighten things up, I'm going to pull up the free EQ that came with the DAW and see if we can find that. And uh, this is another reason this is going to be a lot easier if you haven't tried to make yours loud yet already. So what I'm going to do is this kind of seek and destroy thing uh, and see if I can find that sort of you know, honky, woofy, fat. Angel with the heart of glass. Whoa, 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 whoa. So I've, I've had the benefit of mastering thousands more songs than you have. So I'm going to be faster at this than you. What I just did there might take you 30 minutes, but do it, do it. Spend the time to do it. Cause when you spend 30 minutes doing it on one song, two weeks later, because you've learned that it's going to speed up your work a ton next time. So let's just do this. Listen, all I've done is a little cut with a free EQ that came free with the DAW and with this one, Brown is bypassed. So here are the cutting out that kind of low mid stuff. And that ended up being just a little below 200. Let's see if we're actually closer to our target reference now. Let 
turn that down a tiny bit more. Yeah, we're actually there. And actually, ours is almost starting to sound a little bit brighter. So maybe I did a little bit too much. I'm going to pull that back out. This is a with a heart of glass. Yeah, I still feel there's like honk, honk, honky kind of ness in there that ours has, which isn't empirically wrong or right. But if we're looking at going for a target reference, yeah, there's a thing in there on ours that we're not hearing in the target reference. With the heart of glass, a checkered past, you must be careful. There's that kind of honking I was talking about. Let's try and pull that out. With the heart of glass, a checkered past, you must be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. She's a and I still feel that there's, let's go back and check. I still feel like there's something in the low end that's different. Rain falls in real time. Angel. Yeah, it's, I hear something on our target reference. The low end is really, really deep. And ours is kind of more up in a throaty area. So I'm going to see if I can find that. And one of the things you'll find is, you notice I'm using terms like honky, boxy, throaty. Uh, and I actually have to check if I want to tell you what these uh, frequencies are. But. Angel, with the heart of glass, checkered past, you must be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing Good, let's compare that to our target. Hmm, they're starting to sound like they could live on the same album. One thing you'll notice too is that our snare drum actually pops out more. So when I listen back and forth, I'll tell you what I kind of hear. Um, the target reference does have that big sub low end in there. Uh, our snare drum is popping out a little bit more. Um, and that's because we haven't limited it yet. Um, and there still feels like a little, a little bit more aggressive on the top end of our target. So let's hear ours. Checkered past, you must be careful. Yeah, we're, we're in the ballpark of this. And so no need for us to spend, you know, 20 minutes of me going back and forth. But this process that I've done here is trying to get it closer to our target reference without doing any kind of boosting, without doing any kind of fancy stuff, just going in going, what does ours have too much of compared to our target reference? And one thing that's good too is it's really helpful to develop your skills to just work and work to get one of your mixes to sound as close as possible to the target reference. So don't worry about your own biases, taste, or anything. Just try and get them as close as you can because the more and more you do that, the more and more you're actually going to, you know, kind of develop your skills. And then also too, that is a helpful thing when you start applying this more in your work is to actually pull in a few different references. And I'll show you some of that a little bit later. But, um, and if you can start listening, go listen to three other references, maybe from three different albums and go, oh, wow, mine has way too much of this compared to these. And if you just go in and get rid of what yours has too much of, it's kind of amazing how much uh, you can get your stuff to sound like a pro master and, you know, get to that broadcast quality thing that uh, that you're always shooting for. All right, so all I've done is free EQ that came with the DAW. I, 
I actually heard a little thing up in the high mids I might want to adjust to. She's a fragile. But be careful. Yeah, hi, careful. And in the guitar says a range around that. And and that's kind of how I'm thinking about stuff. Uh, I've done this enough to know that eh, it's probably going to be in the one to 2K range. So I'm going to, again, go in and boost. Just be careful. She's a fragile thing. Yeah. So see how much of mastering is just finding the stuff that doesn't sound cool and making there be less of that? So I've just done this small adjustment. I haven't done anything dramatic, but let's see if this small change makes a difference. Just be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. She's a fragile. Listen to this again while I do it. Um, listen to the guitars getting smoother, the, the voice getting a little more clarity and opening up. Just be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. Actually, I'm not sure I love that now. It's Make mistakes all the time. But. Be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. And now all these EQs in and out. Be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. She's a fragile thing, but this. So notice how it's getting a little bigger sounding, a little brighter sounding. And take a look at these meters right here. Notice this shows input and output level. So when it's bypassed, they should be the same. But notice how the, le the level is actually getting a little bit lower when I you know, cut because we're reducing energy, reducing frequencies. Be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing. So we've lost a couple dB of energy there. So I'm just doing this for demonstration, but I'm going to actually try and do a little bit of makeup gain. So boost the output so that that the level in terms of what our meters see is the same with or without these cuts. So let me adjust that for a second. Just be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. So it's not a big difference, about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 dB. So, so basically when I introduce these cuts now, we're going to level match. We're going to compensate those a little bit. And let's see what that sounds like. Just be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. So listen to that again. Like This is the cool, fun stuff of mastering, is finding those frequencies. And when we do this, the mix gets a little more clear. To me, it feels a little deeper, a little wider. Uh, a little more punch, and that's just by using this free EQ that came with the DAW and doing a little bit of cutting. So let's check this out. Just be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. So yeah, we, we started to get some of that major label sheen without doing anything significant and using the free EQ that came with the DAW. So let's bring this back up to its regular level, uh, our target. So what we're gonna do now is actually go in and make it louder. And we're gonna use a brick wall limiter. Um, I picked this one specifically cause it sucks and I hate it. Um, so yeah, this is the, the, this free EQ that comes with Pro Tools is actually very, very good for clean cutting. Their limiter kind of sucks. So yeah, just, you know, look at companies like, like Isotope or FabFilter, uh, and for not a whole lot of money, you're going to get much better limiters. But basically, uh, this is going to push everything up and make it hit the ceiling and not let anything past it. And this is a huge part of, uh, of 
of mastering in terms of getting those levels. Uh, I strongly encourage you to save this process until your mastering stage. Don't do this while you're mixing. Uh, I don't see any upside to that at all because you can always do it more later. But because also if we've done this limiting thing, uh, it actually would make it more difficult for us to do that corrective uh, EQ and other tricks you might use. So on this one, it's rather simple. Ceiling, um, how loud do we want it? And you could leave it at zero, but I don't recommend that these days. Usually go down about half a dB or so because if this gets converted to MP3 or other formats, sometimes if it's up at the top, it can actually create some problems. And so what this is gonna do, when I pull the threshold down, that's going to be the max. Anything that hits that threshold will get smacked down and it's gonna automatically push level up. So the more I turn this down, the lower it, the louder our master is gonna get. She thinks she'll keep him round. She's a fragile thing, a complicated angel with a heart of glass, a checkered past. You must be careful. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break your heart. So you can see how much I'm attenuating or turning stuff down. So I'm only reducing the dynamic range here, 1.3 dB, which isn't a whole lot. But listen how dramatically it's changing the sound of our master. She thinks she'll keep him round. She's a fragile thing. A complicated... All right, now that we've done that, let's listen to our target reference. She's a fragile thing, a complicated a complicated Our target's a little louder, so I'm gonna just go ahead and pull that down a little bit more. A complicated angel. Check that out. We are in the ballpark. And let's just put this into perspective. That Tragically Hip record was mastered by Bob Ludwig. Bob Ludwig to mastering is what Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson is to boxing, is what uh, Michael Jordan is to basketball. He is the greatest of all time. And we just using two plugins, came free with our DAW, got us into that ballpark, into that neighborhood. So, um, yeah, not so bad. And we haven't done anything fancy, but there are a couple of things here. I remember I said that I, the low end on our target was much more powerful. I had that deep subby kind of low end. Fragile thing. And ours doesn't really have that. Well, let's see if we can get it. I'm gonna stick with free EQ that came with a DAW. And in reality, what I'll usually do is kind of start with a lot of clean cuts. And if I'm gonna boost, whether it's using my hardware or software, I'll usually, usually use a different EQ uh, for boosting a little bit later. And I don't like this one for boosting, but we're gonna use it anyway. So we're just gonna pull up another instance of that to keep it separate, just so it's a little more like my real workflow. And so, that deep subbiness on a bass, a lot of that is around like 50 hertz, 60 hertz. We all know that's the hip hop kick drum sound, that boom, boom, boom. So that and below uh, is kind of our deep subby stuff. So let's start around 55 and just do a little, little boost there. That's 3 dB, that might be a lot, but we're gonna try it anyway, see if it gets us closer. Also, the original mix doesn't have a lot of that down there, so it may not be dramatic. It's just a different bass sound, uh, but let's try it. This is our right. angel With a heart of glass A checkered past You must be careful 
Here it started to bring out that kind of low round roundness in there, a little bit of our target reference. So I'm actually pretty happy with this so far. Fragile thing. She's a fragile thing. Actually, now that it's louder and cranked up, at least compared to our target reference, the high end's almost getting a little bit harsh. So let's kind of go back in here, pick one more frequency up in that harsh range. And depending on the kind of harshness, uh, you know, 2.5K is that piercing kind of thing, but a lot of that harshness will be up around 3 to 4K or up around like 7K. There's different styles. But what we're going to do is, again, we're going to boost a little bit and notice how I keep making this a little narrow to hunt for it so I can focus, then often widening that out a little bit. So I'm basically going to sweep around and see which stuff sounds like garbage. She's a fragile thing. A complicated angel. Oh yeah, that sucks. Let's have less stuff that sucks in our master. Yeah, not too dramatically, because also that 4K range, 4K isn't an ugly range in itself. 4K is great. That's sort of the smack on top of a kick drum. Uh, that's sort of the pick attack on a bass guitar. Um, that's sort of the presence of a lot of nice vocalists. So it's not bad. And again, robots can't tell us <laughs> what sounds pleasing and what doesn't. But in this one, I think if we pull down a little bit of that, uh, it will smooth things out. She's a fragile thing, a complicated angel with a heart of glass. Yeah, I think that smoothed it out a little bit. Um, remember I said I hate Maxim? <laughs> One of the reasons I hate Maxim is because when you do start to do limiting on stuff, it actually starts to get uh, harsh and ugly, which is uh, why... I never use it unless I want to show folks that you can actually do some really good work just on the um, with the free stuff that came with your DAW. So she's a fragile thing. So we've just done a whole lot. What I will do in my own work, I might actually break some of these EQ duties out to multiple different equalizers. If there are big problems, I might use some specialized tools to do it. But look how ridiculously close you can get to the greatest mastering engineer of all time with, oh yeah, the free stuff, one good EQ and one crummy EQ that came free with the DAW. Um, you might actually see also people talking about compressors for plugins. Um, another plugin that I hate is, um, don't even know where it is. You, you can actually sort of see <laughs> uh, my collection of stuff, but uh, yeah, the compressor that comes free with Pro Tools, they have some other stuff that's good, but we're just going to, you know, use their crummy one. And if we needed it, and we're going to set the attack eh, a little bit on the slower side, release a little bit on the slower side. And uh, ratio eh, about in the middle, you know, about uh, you know, four. Let's do four. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust this. So it's just doing a little bit of... Uh, of reduction. Again, compression is a complex art that will take me a long time to explain well, but just, just to try it. Some, some of the things is if you do a little bit of compression, things will start to glue together, uh, even possibly using this terrible pl plug-in that comes free with the DAW. She's a fragile thing, a complicated angel with a heart of glass. Checkered past, you must be careful. If she's a friend. So, um, yeah, so that's doing about a 2 dB of reduction. So we're going to boost that up. And really, the only big reason to do this compensation is to demonstrate. But let's see if just even that kind of everything in the middle does something interesting to the character of our master. We'll start with it off. She's a fragile thing, a complicated angel. There we go. Yeah. Genie cries easy. It doesn't take much to set her off. But 
Steven seems to know. So what I want you to listen for, there's lots going on here, but that snare drum really pops out and our compressor is just knocking that down a couple dB. And then we're bringing everything else up, which when we turn the snare down and bring everything else up, that makes everything else bigger and louder. So our guitars are going to come up. Voice is going to come up. Um, piano is going to come up. Everything else is going to come up a little bit. So it can glue it together and make things sound a little more exciting. But also notice we lose a little bit of presence from that snare drum and bring up a little bit more room ambience from the drums. That's not good or bad. It's just you as the creative uh, maestro will uh, will decide. Genie cries easy. It doesn't take much to set her off. But Steven seems to know how to calm her down. Like handling China or walking on eggshells. So, yeah, so we're getting pretty close. Again, the more you do this, as soon as you sort of solve one problem, sometimes other things will come up. Uh, and due to the crummy tools that we're using, um, you know, that kind of create a little bit of harshness, like that maxim. To me, it's actually getting too sibilant. And uh, the the de-esser in this, cutting out sibilants, is actually uh, not worth even using. Um, where's the one I use? Uh, I use tons of stuff, but the uh, the one I use most for de-essing is from this company called Isotope. And uh, so the essing is that, that spittiness that comes out. Let me just show you on actually a decent. Genie cries easy. It doesn't take much to set up. So I'm going to set it so it's just cutting down the, uh, the S's and not everything else. See, I'm soloing just the stuff. The output S's only is showing us what it's cutting out. So there's not a lot of really good stuff in there that we're cutting out, but let's see if this works. We'll start without it. Cries easy. It doesn't take much to set her off. Much set to set her off. Let's try it. I'll play that one more and then with some DSing. Cries easy. It doesn't take much to set her off. Cries easy. It doesn't take much to set her off. But Steven seems to know. I think I did a little aggressively, but that's just kind of one of the tricks that we'll use and the, something that jumped out to me. But I still do want to get back to before we talk about fancy stuff. Let's see where we're at now with our free plugin mastering and the greatest mastering engine in the world. Glass, checkered path. We've actually made ours a little bit louder, so I'm going to reduce that. She's a fragile thing. Remember early on I said what I heard when I compared the two? I heard a little bit more high-end energy in our target, and now ours is actually brighter. And look at all the high-end boosting we have done. None, none, none. Not to say that that's illegal or there aren't times we would absolutely want to do that, but we didn't need to. And this is one thing to be super careful of. A lot of times, uh, you know, your mastering presets would just be this big smiley face. Boost the brightness, boost the low end, and everything sounds more exciting. But in a situation like this, that actually would have moved us away from our target reference. But <laughs> just to make things a little bit more confusing... Uh, Let's compare this tragically hip record and then to another great kind of little bit rocky acoustic song. amazing John Mayer record and mix. Now that actually ha sounds a lot brighter and edgier uh, than either ours or our target. 
both are great. Both both were hit records. Uh, the Tragically Hip, not so much here, but that's a massive multi-platinum hit in Canada. And uh, John Mayer obviously has had some success. So, so it's going to get a little confusing when you dive into it, but that's one of the advantages of target references and you know, some days when I walked into the studio, most of the time I could sit down. I'm like, ah, I know this and do it well. But some days I kind of feel off my game and I'll actually spend some time going through and listening to a bunch of records that I know and love really well to sort of recalibrate my ears so that when I'm making something really bright or really boomy or dark, I know I'm doing it intentionally. One other thing I want to point out with this is Notice all the really fancy high-tech super stereoizer widener kind of things that we've done in our master. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Um, one of the things a lot of people jump into is using fancy tricks to try and make a mix sound wider. Um, I do use tools like that, but I'd say about once every maybe five or 10 years. And and I master hundreds and hundreds of songs every year. So I would actually discourage you from making those a regular part of it. A lot of those sort of widener things do what they do by actually hurting the middle and <laughs> therefore making the outsides sound a little wider. I do, my masters do come out sounding wider, but that actually is almost always due to me EQing things in a way to, to make things sound a little wider or doing subtle adjustments of some of the material in the middle. I would discourage you from a lot of the fancy stuff. The, the core tools you're really talking about for mastering are EQ to cut out stuff that doesn't sound cool. Um, EQ to maybe boost more of the stuff that's cool and you want more of. Uh, maybe some compression and some limiting. And that is most of what you're going to need to use for mastering. Uh, and as you're starting to develop, I would really encourage you to actually spend time uh, with those kind of tools. So like I mentioned a couple, you know, cool plugins, you know, things like FabFilter has a package, um, Isotope uh, has this ozone thing that's got a whole bunch of stuff, great stuff in there, but focus on your work with these basic tools because that's going to uh, really improve your skills and it's actually going to have you doing mastering in a way that is much more similar to how the pros are doing it. So we got a few minutes left and I want to share a couple other little things for you. Um, again, mostly what I do is I start by doing subtractive EQ to kind of get rid of the stuff that is not cool before I go in and start boosting up other stuff. And just if you're curious, uh, this is actually the <laughs> crazy EQ that I use for my subtractive EQ. It allows me to do some very complex things. But for the most part, um, this one that comes free with your DAW probably works pretty well. And the other one just kind of gives me more flexibility rather than a dramatically different sound. Uh, but let's say, for instance, we do want to kind of be more aggressive with our master. Let's say that our, our vision or the vision of our clients is they say, yeah, yeah, we dig that tragically hip thing, but we want something more bright and aggressive like that John Mayer thing or uh, that Daughtry thing. Yeah, no problem. We can do it. Again, I don't really use this EQ much for boosting, but let's just stay in this theme of doing everything free that came with the DAW. But here's the important thing that I want you to remember. And uh, actually, before we do that, let me show you this. So here's ours. With the heart of glass. When the heart is Notice how there's kind of a crack, crack on top of that snare, little edge forward on the voice that, uh, that we don't have on ours compared to what our target reference was. Thing with this fragile thing will break your heart. So a little bit of crack on top. And if we go over and listen to this John Mayer thing, which is obviously mastered way louder, but also brighter on top. Well, we got to go ahead and do some boosting to get those. The really important thing I want you to kind of keep in mind is that it's generally a good practice when you're boosting 
to try and keep your cues really wide. You don't have time to get into the technical support, technical side of why that is. But so many of the kind of cool analog EQs that we love for tone, they all have really wide um, uh, cues, meaning when you boost a frequency, you're boosting quite a bit on the above and below that. And the reason for that is it's just smoother. We use the term musical sounding. So let's see if we can bring out a little bit of that sort of snare drum crack on top. Oops, here we go. <laughs> Must be careful Cause she's a fragile thing But this fragile thing Will break her heart She's a fragile thing But this fragile thing Angel With a heart of glass A checkered past There, <laughs> that just little boost there, 2.2 dB, already went too much in that direction if our target was this Tragically Hip song. But if we want to go for something like this John Mayer song, it's just, this is a really aggressive top. And, um, oh, before I do that, let me show you this. Um, when I'm going to turn, I'm going to turn this EQ off and on, and I talked about wanting to bring out some of that crack from the snare drum, and we did that a little bit, but listen what it also does to the other elements. Listen to what it does to the guitars. Uh, listen to anything it might do on the voice just with this one little boost angel with the heart of glass checkered past you must be careful if she's a fragile thing but this fragile thing will break her heart she's a so we did bring out some of that crack on the snare but we also to me made the voice a little kind of nasally i didn't that didn't work for me and also the guitars um it brought them forward but not in a very pleasing way so we you as the the maestro or the maestra for all of us have to decide on that and this is one of the reasons why robots can't do this work for you um uh, but here we are here's the john mary one they're getting older i wonder if they've wished for fragile thing but this fragile so that's really aggressive. I've developed my ear enough to know there's a lot going on probably around 10K. So we're going to do a similar thing here. Um, we're going to, let's, let's, I'll sweep around, but we'll start around 10K because that's probably where it is. But we're going to keep our cue really wide, really musical sounding. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her heart. She's a fragile thing, but this fragile thing will break her. So notice how that's bringing up um, kind of the attack, high-end attack of the cymbals. It's also bringing up some of the sibilance in the voice, which yeah, may or may not like, but you actually hear a lot of that sibilance in the John Mayer track. Just be careful. Actually, that John Mayer record's a lot brighter. Let's go for thing, it. But this fragile thing will break your heart. So that gets us a little bit closer. We're never going to get exactly there, of course, because in that John Mayer mix, the cymbals themselves are mixed more aggressively. There is more of a top end boost on the voice. But the important thing about this is what, if you are going to start boosting outside of like the low end, once you get into the mid, high mids, the high, the high end, always recommend uh, you know starting with a wide thing and seeing if you can do that. You can usually get away with more. And one thing too is your your good hardware and your better plugins. Um, will boost um, generally better than your cheapo plugin. So that's one of the reasons you might want to spring for some higher end EQs. The last thing I want to take a look at, let's go ahead and get rid of that high end boost for now, is the question of multi band compressors. It's something I'm asked about constantly 
And there, there's a bunch of people out there, you know, who do videos on how to master yourself that advocate for doing multi-band um, compression. I don't really, uh, I don't really do that so much because um, to me, there's some problems with it. One is when you do multi-band compression, you actually introduce some, it's called phase anomalies. But in a bigger thing, it's important to remember that in our modern style masters, whether we like it or not, they tend to be very loud. So take a look at, you know, <laughs> how much dynamics there are in these big major label hit things. So we actually don't have real dynamics between quiet parts and loud parts. Um, so what happens with that is we, we actually have spectral dynamics, meaning, you know, usually when a chorus comes in like this. Notice that those quiet verses are actually a little bit darker and things get a little brighter when he jumps up into the high register when the hi-hats open up. So when we have these you know, masters that don't actually move much, we get the sense of dynamic from spectral changes. So if we're going to, you know, put a multi-band uh, compressor on and uh, just create a very simple one. So we could create this multi-band compressor and run our, our track through it. We're back to uh, the Dave Mackinoff song. She's a fragile thing. You can actually visually see it's going in and, you know, knocking down the various elements. So if we have a situation where we go from sort of mellow in the verses, darker in the verses, to, um, to more aggressive in the uh, choruses, well, the multiband compressor can actually go in and undo some of those dynamic changes. So what I do use multiband compressors, mostly I'm using them as single band focus compressors. Like say for instance, I wanted to just control the low end. I could actually create a multiband compressor that just did that. She's a fragile thing. So here's actually in this quick scenario, this is what's being compressed. She's a fragile thing. So I have a, if I had a big low end that was kind of getting out of hand, we could just put the compressor on just the low end. She's a fragile thing. A complicated angel. With a heart of glass. A checkered past. You must be... And you probably didn't really even notice that in a big way unless you've got some bigger speakers going on. All right, that is it. I hope uh, this is a little bit helpful. I hope this uh, empowers you a little bit to do more uh, of your own work. And um, yeah, and remember, stay focused on the core parts of mastering, EQ, compression, limiting. And yeah, learn the other stuff because you should learn about everything. But what myself and most professional mastering engineers around the world are doing is really focusing on those core things. And uh, you don't need to buy a ton of stuff at first. Buy, uh, you know, get a few good EQs, compressors, a brick wall limiter that you like. You might even find all that in one bundle and start working with that. And then as you develop your own tastes and approaches, you'll start to have a better view of, oh, should I go out and get this specific plug-in or this specific piece of hardware or anything like that as you develop your skills. So I'm super bummed that we're not hanging out. I will miss all of you terribly uh, this week, but I'm super glad that Michael is doing the right thing and keeping us all safe by doing this online. And I'm really looking forward to uh, giving lots of you big hugs when I see you all at the Road Rally next year. All right. Thanks a bunch, everybody.